Well, welcome everybody to uh, our next Nexus webinar. I'm super excited to have uh, Will Mancini joining us. Uh, we've been using his material for a really long time. Um, uh, five, six years ago, I got introduced helping plant one of our churches uh, in Loveland, Colorado. I uh, just got introduced to the vision frame and just, just so many light bulbs just started coming on of just being able to to hang a lot of this visionary language of what is mission, what is vision, all these different things. And so um, through through the years, we've just been able to uh, to, to upgrade some of our training. Uh, I've been been able to be certified and, and just get trained under Will over the last several years, and being able to uh, really just deliver this material a little bit better. But uh, recently, um, Will's kind of wrote a new book called Future Church, and kind of directing and moving um, uh, kind of in a prequel setting of of what Church Unique is and, and God Dreams is, and moving into to, to what that looks like. So, first of all, let me just say thank you so much, Will, for for joining us. It's so good to have you, man. Yeah. Oh man, Andrew, always great to be with you, and and uh, excited to be with those connected to uh, your network today. Awesome. Well, uh, if you would just kind of give us a, a reasoning behind um, this idea of future church. So, so you wrote yeah. Church Unique early 2000s, um, kind of came up with God Dreams uh, 2015, 2016 uh, as an updated version of that. And now as we yeah. as we turn into uh, another decade looking at ministry and, and life and what that looks like, what does what, what was the reasoning behind the need for a, a prequel to that that content? Yeah, yeah, great question. I, there's several threads that were at play for me. One was uh, I had, you know, Lyle Schaller was a distant mentor, didn't get a lot of time with him individually, but he would teach that between 15, and 20 years, if you've consulted that long, you'll probably want to reset your toolbox. And I was thinking a little bit about that, um, you know, 2017, 18. The other, the other thread, and more, most importantly, Two things were happening for me that uh, the signs that change was coming. Uh, one is that um, I believe in, you know, around 2015 would be the, the, the mile marker. During that, that year, one of the posts that took off that I wrote that actually Kerry Newhoff would take up, like in one of his first couple of podcasts, was the trend that our most committed people are going to start attending church less and less. And some of our best ministry models were experiencing that dynamic. And I think the design of how we did church, I think that's the year I would signal that we were seeing how the church had a lower value proposition to the believer. And I'll unpack that a little bit more. So to me, there was design issues in the air. Like, are we really delivering on, you know, the mission, if you will, to the everyday disciple? The, the most, like, apparent one for me what these are these threads that are emerging, you know, reset the consulting toolbox. Um, maybe the design of our ministries is not as good as we think. Um, but the biggest thing for me was I was able to look back over now, you know, over 15 years, you know, hitting, you know, way past the 10,000 hour mark of facilitation, you know, maybe almost lapping that number. And I was real, I could real, I could, I could acknowledge with a new, um, self-awareness that I had done vision framing processes with churches and some of them, you know, maybe the, the low 20%, maybe, you know, kind of put, put clients in buckets of thirds in terms of how their outcomes were, you know, how they how, how they would do long-term. And I realized there was too many churches that were better at articulating the disciple making results that they weren't getting. <laughs> it was like, it's like, I didn't want the vision frame to be a marketing exercise. I wanted it to be you know, a disciple making, you know, exercise. And so th with all those things happening, I, um, I remember in February of 2016, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and jotted down seven ideas that would become the seven laws of real church growth, which is, you know, the subtitle to, you know, to the future church book. But um, uh, that's the threat. In the end, the way that I'm going to name the problem in future church and put all that together you know, it's, I believe, and this was all, Andrew, as you know, before COVID. So like, in fact, this book, I sent this book to the publisher March 8th, 2020, one week before we're going to start closing our churches. So I was anticipating the fault line of 2020, which COVID just dramatically accelerated and made obvious for everybody. Um, but the but the problem, I, all that culminated in naming the problem is this. 
Um, functional great commission in North America too many times has become go into all the world and make more worship attenders, baptizing them in the name of small groups and teaching them to volunteer a few hours a month. And I'm like, that's not what Jesus gave his life for. And uh, that's not our ultimate calling. So um, worship small groups and serving are important elements, but that's not, that's not the mission of Jesus. Yeah, no, that's good. I think um, I, I was going back through your material uh, with the, the Future Church book um, this week and, and and just re kind of recalibrating is what it feels like a lot of a lot of church leaders, a lot of church networks and uh, different people have, have really done and our, our director at Nexus, uh, Phil Claycomb is going to has done a great job of that. And, um, <clears throat> you know, just introducing us to just materials by either like a Dan Grider and Starfish Movement or Roy Moran's material uh, with the spent matches and things of that nature. And so just really getting back to a fundamental understanding of we need to not just play church get together every Sunday and just play church, but really, really do the deep work and understanding that. And so uh, you introduce a tool in the book uh, that, that we've used a little bit in the church unique process, probably haven't really doubled down on it the way that you do in uh, future church, but being able to introduce the, the upper room and the lower room. Can you uh, maybe maybe draw for us a little picture of what that looks like? And, um, and, and, and I'd like to bring some of that into our, our context as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that that's, um, as you said, Andrew, we've we've used this before. And what I, you know, actually, in this tool, we'll introduce the language of lower room and upper room identity. And I almost called future church, uh, you know, upper room leadership or the church of the upper room. So that's how big of a master tool this this is. And as you've seen before, what we what we do simply is do a little figure you know, drawing of a house with two, two floors on it. And we acknowledge that when people come into the church, they, they're coming in um, on the, you know, on the first floor. Uh, and what we're asking the question is, why does this person who comes into your church, they get connected relationally, however they're engaged, why do they call your church home? And we're using the upper room, lower room to suggest that there are two fundamental places of connection. And I like to use the, ask the question, what emotionally connects people to your church? And so that we say there's four common things in the lower room, the place itself, the personality of the staff, you know, usually the senior pastor, there's programs happening, obviously. And, uh, and then there are people, there are friends, and there's a vibe to the place and the relationships in the place. And what we're saying is that, you know, these, that we want every church to have a great lower room. We want these things to be attractive, dynamic, well thought through, um, but that there's a problem if this is the only place of connection, this lower room area. And we can quickly imagine that, a, you know, a, a healthy church, you know, is going to be, these things are going to change over time. Um, uh, these are concrete things, uh, you know, places change, people come and go, or, you know, leaders come and go, programs, you know, need to be updated and tweaked and so forth. And then, and then people, I mean, um, these are good things. They're not the ultimate things. And so there's a lot of ways to talk about this lower room uh, identity, uh, but we I ultimately like to call it, you know, this is a place of provision. So it's provision. It's for the vision. It's stuff God gives the church to accomplish its mission, hopefully, but too many of the times, it's all we have. And so we, we ask the question, you know, how do you get folks up into this place called the upper room? And we would simply call this purpose and to, to kind of follow along with the, 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 the P language. But what we're really talking about here is your unique disciple making vision and that, that gospel impact dream that you have. And of course, all the tools that come along with that in the vision frame, in the horizon storyline, the one four one four in the vision frame. So we're suggesting that that God really, you know, designed the movement where you get a, get excited about, you know, the mission of Jesus. You get excited about a local family of believers having a dream for impact. You get excited about, you know, values and, you know, the, the outcomes, the, the character and competencies of Jesus that we're aiming at, and like that stuff is so much more meaningful than just, you know, 
the color of the carpet, you know, a guy I like to hear his style of teaching, et cetera, but that people can't experience this upper room uh, until it's named well. And it, as you know, Andrew, so many pastors are just, you know, it's complex, messy work. We're moving at the speed of, you know, a hundred miles an hour. And we just don't take the time to articulate, clarify, discern, articulate, and skillfully communicate this, you know, on a daily yeah. basis. So people can't really catch the, the vision, if you will. And so this, this just asks the question, what is your current, what is the motivation of your current group of people who you're serving, who are following you as a, as a church leader? And, and what is the current, you know, gravity of the lower room versus the opportunity and numbers of people in the upper room. And you know, two quick layers as we kind of put this foundational picture forward. Um, one layer is just imagine an eight-year-old boy or girl. If you ask them what they want most for their life, every answer will be tangible. You know, I, my, my daughter was giving me this Lego bracelet this morning. I got in late last night and, you know, we're getting ready to go go on a trip to see uh, my next grandchild, my second grandchild being born. And she's loading all her precious, you know, her little pink pony uh, and her little, her little light fluffy dog. And you know, like, what do you want most to, you know, to, it is, it's going to be tangible, electric scooter, Xbox, whatever. Ask the parents of an eight-year-old child, what do you want most for your child? Every answer will be intangible. They will have this intuitive. It's not a matter of like, quote, you know, spiritual maturity. It's, it's just a human thing. Like a mature person is going to say, I want acceptance for you. I want you to know God and walk with him. I want you to have self-confidence and understand your gifting, these kinds of things. So it's just super basic that we see this in all of life. You see it, another lens that's so important is, is Jesus's ministry. You know, feeding the 5,000 men, which is easily 15 to 20,000 men, women, and children. I mean, this was a lower room place for Jesus's ministry. You know, in John chapter six, Jesus just turns on some heavy cryptic teaching he's talking about being the bread of life and he finally says and you know john 6 66 i hey if you don't you know eat my flesh and drink my blood you can't have eternal life and this is so shocking the lower room evacuates you're like we don't get this guy's a little weird that just freaked me out even the disciples in the upper room you know they're about to hit the escape hatch they're not quite not sure but they finally say well you know we don't have anywhere else to go we we know we know here's, here's the words of eternal life so Jesus is not afraid to cut down. I mean, Jesus creates his own COVID-like crisis. And he's not afraid for the lower room to come and go because he understands that the upper room is the future of the church. And so the work of three years of public ministry results in 120 people in the literal upper room of Acts 1. And that's the sweet spot. That's, that's the size of your church. This is the size of your ministry opportunity. Uh, well, what ha what's happening in North America is we're, 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 we're counting this as our church. And of course, Andrew, COVID was that great revealer. It was a great purifier. You kind of see, what, you know, where people are even more when you can't gather, you know, on a Sunday morning. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, uh, I really like the, <clears throat> that, that eight-year-old boy story of, of dealing with the tangibles and the intangibles of church. And, and you talk a lot about just seeing what success looks like. And even, even just that, that Jesus mentality where you're talking about the crowds of up to five or, you know, even 15,000 people with like women and children and stuff like that. But that's kind of that lower room mentality that, that all pastors really seem like, man, it'd be great to have a church of 15,000 people. But when you talk about the real church size of, uh, in the book, you mentioned just even the 120 of like, this is, this is what was left after, after everything that kind of took place. Um, I, I really appreciate that. I want, I want to ask you about the, uh, you talk about the three types of churches in your book, um, about, yeah, about yeah. program church or house church or something like that. Um, but I want to start with, uh, just, to, uh, uh, share for a second. Um, one of the things in our context that we've, we've talked through is, is this idea from Dan Grider, uh, in his book called starfish movement. And this really reminded me of your, your upper room, lower room thing, but just to kind of bring it into our context, uh, guys, Phil has, has talked about this for a little while in the Nexus context where, where a high discipling leader, would, would end up with a house church. 
research, but if you have low, low directional leader capabilities, you kind of end up in this, this idea of just being a, a house church and disciple making movement. But on the, on the other side of things, if you're a high directional leader and very low in the disciple making, you have this anthill mentality where, where the anthill is kind of built primarily off of the body of dead ants, you know, and so just this idea of program church or running people ragged. But once you once you really combine the two of them, you become the starfish. And the, the cool thing about a starfish is you cut off a leg and then it grows into a completely separate starfish. Uh, and just so in this in this mentality, and that reminded me of, and just want to use that as a picture to kind of set up what you want to share uh, about the the three churches in, in your yeah. context with the, the upper room, lower room. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great, it's a great tool and picture of uh, the directional, I would say you got the organizational leadership versus the discipling leader. Um, yeah, very similar, uh, good, great connection there. We're going to use the image of the lower room, upper room, and what we'll do is just, we'll create three types. What happens when you have a lower room with no upper room? What happens when you have an upper room with no lower room? And what does it look like when you have both? And it might be easy just to draw this really quickly, Andrew. But um, when when you have the you know when you have the four P's happening and people are all connected in the lower room, but there's really not an, an upper room, we're just calling that program church. And and I want to be specific with this language. I'm speaking to 2020 to 2040. I'm thinking of the next generation of how we think about church. So the warning shot across the bow of the Future Church book is, hey, you could have done, you could have put four Ps together, done program church for the last 80 years and be super highly successful, quote, successful in the eyes of church leaders, magazines, you know, the best dope stories and not really have, you know, a dynamic upper room or really not have relational disciple making taking place. We're not mad about that. I'm just saying... You're really not going to be able to do that as much in between 2020 and 2040. And I would say, uh, Andrew, that while pre-COVID, while I was making that case, you know, COVID just made it 2030. It just pushed us 10 years down the road of what we would have seen, you know, on Mother's Day in 2021. It will be Mother's Day of 2031 if COVID didn't happen. It's just where, where we are. And then this is you know, so, so logical and simple. If you have an upper room but no lower room, we call that house church. So this is that organic, you know, high relational disciple making. I mean, I, you know, tell the story of the guy in the book. I mean, punches out of a large mega church in Dallas, gets a job in construction, highly gifted pastor, apostolic leader. He's just leading people to Christ, meeting in home, meeting in his you know living room with 25 people every Sunday. And it's, it's powerful. It's good. It's, you know, but it may, may not be as long-term sustainable, right. As that directional leader kind of element. And so we're just saying future church, which is not meant to be, it's just a placeholder because we're talking about what we don't know yet and see yet. So I think we'll call it something. And, you know, when we're in 2040, looking back, we'll name this last 20 years, something. And it's just the boat band. Don't even need to drive. Just, just doing a boat band. We're not abandoning the four P's. Um, uh, but we're going to have, we're going to have a vision frame there um, in, in, in that upper room. So what I'd say, Andrew, is this is, organization without disciple making this is disciple making without organization i'm just i don't need a budget anymore i don't want to have you know staff elders deacons you know pews whatever blah 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 this is let's let's do organized disciple making so this is that starfish it's organized but it's got relation it's, it exists for the purpose of relational disciple making and we want to see disciple making to the third, fourth generation become, you know, normal part of how we're thinking and designed, and and that's going to start impacting how we think about these four P's. So these provisions start working for that unique disciple making vision. Yeah, no, I I love that. Um, one of one of the things you kind of alluded to earlier was in in the process of doing a lot of the the vision framing. 
uh, and working with churches to bring clarity to them. You and you briefly mentioned this, but you, you've talked about how how a lot of your clients and kind of your confessions of consulting uh, have kind of fit into three buckets. Where where the first one, like they're just killing it, they're doing incredible work for the for the kingdom. The middle bucket is they're they're doing really well, kind of struggling with some things. And the other one, and I think I heard you say this, is that they have a really creative way of articulating the disciple making that they're not doing. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Something to that effect. Um, can yeah. you can you share and maybe just even as a warning to to our guys, and then maybe we can kind of use this as a springboard into the 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 laws or some of the laws that you've kind of come up with. But um, as you as you look at that and and you talk about just just the the crucial nature of crafting words and language to move people to the upper room, but just in one of those confessions, you kind of mentioned that that words isn't the only thing and and just kind of some of the tension or some of the struggle and, and even going back to the need for even writing the writing the book of shifting that paradigm can you just kind of share a little bit about that sure sure well it's we can assert two phrases around words you could say talk is cheap you know but as abraham heschel said words create worlds and so there is this tension with language and I've you know, spent the last 20 years focusing my ministry on how is a language a tool for a leader, because basically all what we're doing right now is using language to communicate and meaning is being transferred in verbal symbols that we're using to communicate. And so a leader's first tool is always his or her words, you know, before there's a flint a hammer a wheel there's a word in in the words you know adam discharged his god-given authority by naming the created order by naming the animals so so i'm never at the end going to give up on that so you 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 know anything we're doing you know we need we need to words will create worlds um on the other hand what i've been able to do is take leaders through the, the successful articulation of this and the challenge isn't the, the the lack of words we we articulate it it's the it's the gravity of the lower room it's the it's the it's the addiction to the lower room and sometimes as i've said many times you know i can i can get you the clarity which is god's clarity and we do it together i mean when i say i can get you it's i'm the conversation guide we're going to land the plane on this but you have to bring the courage you know i can't i can't give you my courage to execute you know and really live out um you know, I just tell church leaders, you're going to stand before Jesus. What, you know, what were you giving your energy, imagination, intelligence, and love to do every day? I mean, you're giving all of yourself this work. What are, what are we actually doing? So that's the tension. And so for me, the seven laws of real church growth, and by the way, we can go to, we can go to this picture and say, you know, program church, the time has come where it's not even a prophetic challenge. Every pastor agrees. This is faking disciples. And we all get that every church is on a continuum of making faking. There's more faking than we, you know, we would want to admit. Um, so what, what, what I was doing is I was capitalizing on the cultural moment to say, you know, we actually all agree now, no matter your faith tribe, no matter how long you've been leading, no matter what size your church is, like we all agree that the church is over-programmed and under-discipled. So let's just name it, get after it. And you know, by the way, what I love to Andrew is no one, no one actually gets called into ministry to do lower room. Like when, when every, everyone who's listening right now, when you're called to ministry, it's an upper room deal. What happens is our success, you know, kind of over time uh, undoes that, that early calling and that, you know, so what I, what I, one of my, one of the greatest outcomes of this book is pastors are saying, hey, I'm falling in love with ministry. I mean, this is what, this is what I got into ministry to do. And you're able to recalibrate some of the, the program church uh, success. Um, so the so the tension on words is I wanted to brought, bring the seven laws to say this. And what I would say is it's a paradigm. The if I relabel something too quickly, I don't enable the mind to make a paradigm shift. So what I want to do now is I want to have great language to name what God is doing. But I want the team to have that upper room paradigm shift that we're doing more pro maybe we're doing more program church than we realize. And let's how do we how do we how do we lead from an upper room 
paradigm or mindset more of the time. So that's how I think about it. Words, words can, you can relabel a bad paradigm and that's not going to get you better results. <laughs> that's good, man. Um, well, can you walk us through uh, just some of these major shifts, uh, some of these these seven laws, yeah. and even even in 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 saying that, I mean that's a pretty bold statement. Like these are seven laws of of real church growth. Like is this uh, a lot of what you're talking about is primarily kind of North American or Western church mentality? Are these seven laws that you're saying you feel like this is this is global church laws of what what actual growth yeah. is and disciple making, or is this more local? Absolutely, I, I think no, I think it's. I think these are model neutral. I think they're time and culture. I mean, I like to think, obviously, nothing is cultural neutral in the sense that it's I'm coming from a culture, but I do think these ideally would could be re-articulated. The same basic idea could be re-skinned in any culture. So, so the irony is, future church really is church, you know, uh, but we're just naming it in our cultural moment. Um, and and so yeah, so I think they're durable and and timeless and that that's what makes it a different book andrew you know my tools well the toolboxes i create well so this is a more of a principle based book than my other books and i wanted to make it a little bit uh you know more readable that way instead of it being a referential uh, toolbox book it you know the, the the field guide in the toolbox book is in the work so we'll uh be be, be getting that out here pretty soon um but yeah the, the seven laws to so the se think of the seven laws uh, it's kind of three, one, and three, because there's a little bit of a movement or a progression with it. And um, it's easy for me to get lost in each law and use the whole time here for each law. So maybe I'll just tee them up very quickly and use them to kind of tell the story. We start with the law of mission. We're saying real church growth starts with the culture of mission, not worship. And we're, we're you know, I'm such, obviously, you know, love worship. I say it's the only activity that unifies and transcends all time. Uh, the angelic hosts are worshiping our living God right now. Um, worshiping weekly as believers is always going to be our universal pattern. What we're saying, though, is you don't actually get a worshiping individual or a worshiping community of believers without the mission of God activating first. And uh, the more that we come back to real church growth, we want to emotionally connect people to a mission if we're going to have more worshiping people tomorrow, we need we need more on mission disciples today. So we're just talking about logical sequence and priority in, in the process. And so we start there. But we've you know, we've inherited and we've all lived in a lifetime where you can start with a culture of worship. Um, the easiest way to talk about this is if you're the last five years, um, last 10 years, I work with a batch of uh, Houston church planners in the Houston Church Planner Network. And I would say in the last five years, they about half of them articulate their strategy at start with a worship service, hoping to get disciples. The other half start with a disciple making engagement or initiative, hoping to start a worship a public worship service someday. And it's that mindset that we're getting at. And we're saying real church growth, you know, starts with that latter picture. What's my disciple making process? Um, you know, evangelistically, you know, developmentally for the believer, and and then we you know, a church planner might cultivate, you know, a community of disciples that, you know, end up offering a public worship experience someday in a community. And there's just a different paradigm or mindset there. Uh, the second law is the law of power. We say real church growth is powered by the gospel, not relevance. And I think there, you know, I think every year in my life, there's different ways in which I can rely on something other than the gospel and that tendency to rely on other um, other things, other lower room things, to be the power source. And you know, one of the statements I make in this in the law in this chapter on the law is I say, I say to church leaders, the gospel is not designed to draw a crowd. Quit being so fixated on drawing a crowd. Like you already have a crowd cloud. That is, you already have a handful of believers who probably know about 120 people in their extended family, in their neighborhood, in their vocational calling, in the, you know, their interests and hobbies. And it's like, if you've got 10 people uh, in your church, you've got a thousand, you know, you get 1200 people in the crowd cloud of those people who call your church home and just do the math. Like, so that what we're saying is the most important crowd is not, you know, the, the end game isn't 
how many people are coming to your worship service. The end game is how do the people who come to your worship service engage their crowd cloud, you know, Monday through Saturday. And I'm wanting the leader to see and feel, you know, at rest, at peace, that this whole thing isn't about growing the Sunday morning machinery. That that the beauty of what of the calling when you got when you start with a culture of worship, you value the crowd cloud of the handful of people. The other thing that's freeing there is we say the future of the church is found in the few. As you invest in the few, they will go out and reproduce their lives in their crowd cloud. The future of your church is in the crowd cloud of a handful of people who are your upper room disciples. The third, and these all kind of packaged together, the third law is the law of love, real church growth is validated by unity, not numbers. And so what happens is we, it, we can too easily build a church, start with worship, powered by relevance, validated by numbers. And we're saying now, real church growth starts with the culture of mission, it's powered by the gospel, and is validated by the unity that those disciples have for one another, which is just going back to basics. It's just basic John 17. How will the world know that the Father sent the Son on this rescue mission? by how the disciples love one another and demonstrate such a powerful unity as they share with the unity of the Godhead himself. So, so, you know, very powerful. The next law kind of what happens is, you know, the new permission era, the eighties and nineties, the, the acceleration of multi-site of big box churches, you know, in 1970, there were no more than 10 mega churches. You know, now there's almost, you know, 2000, mega churches or churches over 2000 attendance. What happens is we, um, we start with worship uh, powered by relevance, validated by unity. We, we start taking the church out of context. The church gets so big, you know, people are driving around for, and I, I asked, I start with the question, can the church be too big? And I said, no, that's not really the best question. And I asked the question, can the church be too non-local? I say, yes, the church can be too non-local. That's the definition of the local church. It's a proximity thing. It's a local expression of a body of believers in Christ. So the law, law four is the law of context. Real church growth is, uh, is local, not imported. Uh, and those, those kind of build up. Once you have successful program church, you don't have, you've, you know, you've kind of violated those first four laws. And it sounds hard. You know what I mean? It's kind of like you've, You've, you've missed those first four laws, and then you don't have time to do the next three laws. So I'll just I kind of stop there. The most successful program churches start with worship, powered by relevance, validated by numbers, and then we start importing people from non-localities, and we're saying this is even a bigger, better kind of church. You know, I live in Houston, Andrew. We have churches that will spin your head, 15,000-seat auditoriums where basketball teams used to meet, and, and now they're filled, you know, three services uh, with 40,000 people. And it's like, okay, if you want to see a, quote, successful program church, come to Houston, Texas. Five minutes on the highway, you'll see these faces on billboards. We've got the biggest lower room churches, you know, that have ever been built. Yeah, so. absolutely, man. That's crazy. <laughs> So you, uh, yeah, so a lot of uh, context and then and then you drop the, the other three um, yeah, the, so the other three, so this is what we don't have time for anymore in program church. It's the next law is the law of development. Real church growth is about growing people, not managing programs. That doesn't need to really be unpacked. I'll just let that kind of hang out there. The other two get more nuanced and they're part of, you know, the, 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 uh, my life work, you know, as much as any of them. Uh, the, sec the law of leadership is that real church growth is led by calling, not celebrity. And one, I think the one of the biggest ideas, and I'll make two quick comments here in the book is, I, I really believe one of the overarching ideas is we do not have authority transfer happening from leader to believer in our churches. Meaning as soon as God comes to earth, he transfers, as soon as Jesus comes to earth, he transfers his authority, the authority to you know, cure diseases, cast out demons, proclaim the kingdom. He gives it away to amateurs and it just starts going. But what happens in program church, whether we think of it this way or not, let me say a word about celebrity. I hope every listener here gets more favor and grows in, in their awareness. Some will get famous. Awesome. Love that. I want more people to read my books. Come on. I want to pray that everybody's ministry enlarges in scope. Jesus was a celebrity. 
Uh, yesterday I was with an African-American pastor in Atlanta. He's got 8,000 people in his church. I said to him, you are a celebrity pastor. Praise God. Here's the deal. Jesus doesn't rely on a celebrity. The future of the church is not built on celebrity. Celebrity can sound like, oh, it's, it's self-centered. It's, let's not talk about motives or anything. It's just the fact is, if a lot of people know who you are, you're a celebrity. Jesus doesn't care and doesn't build. He's going to use that for his upper room purposes, but he doesn't rely on that. Here's the big idea with celebrity. It's a zero-sum game. You can't multiply your celebrity. So if 100,000 people know who Andrew is, you can't just automatically, you know, give some of that celebrity to Bob and Susan and Joe. Like it's a zero sum game. You give away. It just doesn't multiply. So I want to I, what I do is I contrast celebrity and calling or celebrity and authority. Authority is an unlimited resource and every human being in Jesus name. You know, again, uh, walking with Jesus has an Ephesians 2.10 divine design. They're put on earth for such a time as this. And that's a noble, noble contribution that that one of a kind person brings to the kingdom. And what happens is the more the lower room is bringing a celebrity status to, you know, and Andrew, this is so important because I, I don't want to just be contextualized to a mega church. I tell the story in the book on this chapter of a church planner who's got a green room. It's like you need a green room when there's huge crowds and you, know, you have guest speakers coming in to get away. But like, so it's like we just what's the, the green room is kind of propping up this you know status. It's so easy to get connected to. So every church in or every Protestant church in North America elevates the, the, the gifting of a leader to some degree. And we're saying that's that use celebrity, define it broadly, you know, quote celebrity. Like we don't realize how much we are platforming ourselves inside the church and how that is deplatforming or deauthorizing. That like we're not creating commission agents of Jesus every day. We are subtly, this is a mental model. We don't intend it, it's unintended. The mental model is, you know, churches where I go a couple hours a week, I need to help someone find Jesus. I bring them to my pastor who's gifted to do it. So here's the ultimate like rally cry on law, on law six. It's time to declare the pastorhood of every believer. Every believer is a pastor who has a parish. It's that crowd cloud again. And how do we help them name that and see their a kingdom platform where they live, work, and play in the program church, which is essential, the lower room, it's important, exists to help empower each one from calling. And that's, that's the power of the church. And it's not anti-organizational. We still gather. We still are one family and one church, but there's a release of that in a, in a very dynamic way. So real church growth is led by calling, not celebrity. Yeah, last let's, thing. Let's, sorry, real quick. Um, one of yeah. the affirmations that you made in your in your book was uh, just just around that idea of pastorhood of all believers. You know, where we have this reformation of just the transition back into the priesthood of all believers. Like, you don't need a priest to go be this person, but whenever yeah. you you make that shift in a modern day context, like it's it's really getting back to like there's not just the pastor, or you call people Pastor Will or Pastor Andrew, whatever like everyone's a pastor and just getting back to that mentality is, is just as significant a shift as it was, you know, back 400 years ago or, or whenever it was. That's, right. That's so. absolutely right. We needed that to explode dynamite with priesthood, you know, that, you know, hundreds of years ago. Now we need to explode dynamite with that, that the pastor is what's blocking our imagination for how God wants to use uh, everyday disciples. Yeah. yeah I like that. But I get, yeah, I get pretty passionate about that one, as, as you can tell, but, and that, that, you know, that connects to really the unique ministry. So just, if your listeners don't know, you know, we've created a gospel centered life design process where everyday disciples name their special calling. They, they name kind of their, how, what does vocational discipleship look like? And they name their ultimate contribution. I mean, why did God put me on earth? And when you see that play out, it is stunning. It's beautiful. And it, it's really, you know, getting a lot of traction right now, particularly in this in this moment and with the future church tools. Um, it, it's one way I think of this, Andrew, is I think if if Jesus were were in church today and he was calling 12, you know, men to himself to, to invest in, I don't think it would look like starting a small group at the church. I think it would feel more like, you know you know, having a group of guys gather in a vocational setting, you know, and it's interesting that when Jesus says, you know, follow me 
and I will make you fishers of men, he didn't come to them without showing proficiency in their calling. So Jesus is that guy who showed up to professional fishermen and he's, he, he took them to the wrong part of the lake at the wrong time of the day and said, throw your nets over here. And they saw a more productive, they, they saw pro when they thought they were pro status. They saw someone at that next level. And so when Jesus is saying that, he's really raising the bar on them and he's, he's, he's bringing value to them. And there's a respect and credibility at, at a professional, at a vocational level that, that we don't quite fully appreciate, I don't think, today. I mean, Jesus was the best baker you ever met. He was the best bartender you ever met. He was, he was the best fisherman you ever met. And, and then he calls and he has a way of life he's going to show you. And, you know, our churches are filled of people who have a nine to five and real calling, but we don't see that as a beachhead or a medium for disciple making because our program church is robbing us of that imaginative opportunity. It's unbelievable. Um, so any, anyhow, uh, that, that I don't have time to go into that toolbox, but we, there's a toolbox and a pathway to release that um, capacity. And if we have time, I'll show that in our funnel fusion drawing. Uh, the last law is just quick upper room, lower room reminder. It's the law of vision. And we say real church growth uh, is energized. That's the word. It's energized by sh shared imagination, not shared preference. And it kind of comes back. And basically we say, we have to say there's three primary tools or things you must use to maximize the imaginative capacity of the people of God. Um, God's word, but specifically the parables. The parables become the, the mirror, the picture, the window to build my imaginative capacity as an everyday disciple. Secondly, is, your, is the personal calling of individuals. So it goes back to, you know, do individual disciples dream about how their life makes an impact where they live, work, and play. And then third, it's that, it's that God dreams piece of as a community of people who are living in a cultural moment, you know, we're living in a context, a city, a community, a town, rural, urban, whatever that is, what is our dream? What is our gospel dream over the next five, 10 years? I know you're God dream certified, Andrew. It's that idea that we have an individual dream for our life. We have an individual dream as, as the people of God. Those are locally contextual and specific. Those can't be scripted. Those aren't in scripture, but scripture you know, is a guidebook to, to imagine that. And then we have the parables of Jesus for all time. Um, so that's, your, that, that's where you get a lot of energy there. Here, here's one way I like to say it, just to illustrate it. I'm thinking of a church in Charlotte that has a beautiful wedding vision and their dream, beautiful marriage vision. They say you can have a beautiful wedding in a day, but it takes a lifetime to have a beautiful marriage. And they wanna re significantly reduce the, the divorce rate, five zip codes you know, around where, they, where, they, where their people live, work and play. And they have said, they have said, we, we're gonna invite you into a marriage mentoring movement out here that's gonna bless people in, in the name of it. And, and like when you get people excited and contributing to an idea like that, a dream like that, you don't have time to, you know, argue about the colors of the carpet or when do we stop wearing masks or not? I mean, all of a sudden, all these preferences just, you know, are they still there? Of course they are. But do they energize us the same way? No, because we have something much, much bigger that that's our energy source. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to, I want to go back on and touch on one just based on uh, where Nexus is at right now in our context. You actually, uh, in, in law number two, you talk about just the power of the gospel, the the, the um, real church growth is powered by gospel, not relevance. And um, and even towards the end of it, you actually quote um, Bill Hull and uh, Ben Sobel's book, The Discipleship Gospel, by saying that the uh, the gospel you preach determines the disciples you make. We've actually, over the last year or so, have, have partnered with Ben Sobels and those guys in the Bonhoeffer Project and started bringing a lot of our planters through just a re-founding, a re formulating of a foundation they, they call it going upstream like where we talk about discipleship strategies and implementation is kind of midstream and downstream but going back upstream to talk about you know just answering fundamental question like what is the gospel and and reformulating and refounding your gospel in in jesus and all that type of stuff but can you can you talk a little bit more just because that's where we've been focused on the last um year or so uh yeah. just a little bit more about just the the power of the gospel and how that influences vision yeah, yeah. 
Well, there's, there's two thoughts I have on that. One is I, when I think of Paul's statement for, I am not ashamed of the power of the gospel. I think for most of my life, I misunderstood what I think Paul is meaning there. I think it's easy to interpret that as Paul's not embarrassed to like the, in the activity of talking about Jesus, like he's not embarrassed to do that. So like embarrassed to associate myself with Jesus or tell the people the good news about Jesus when I'm on an airplane, like I'm not embarrassed to talk about that. It would be easy. Some people would be embarrassed. I don't think that's what it is. It's, you know, it's, it's going back to saying I, I didn't rely on eloquent preaching when I was with you. I was a steward, you know, it was the power of God that we were, we, that was happening. And so I think there are ways that, you know, we, we over rely on tactics, techniques, lower room stuff. And our shame is not embarrassment talking about Jesus. The, the shame is like, I actually don't really believe that the power was in this message. I really think the power is in my charisma, uh, you know, to, to draw a crowd. And, you know, I tell stories on that. But I, I think another angle um, is, you know, the, you know, the, the, the focused idea that there's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And I mean, that's, you know, when I think gospel, most of my life, I've thought of that. And what we want to, what we do when we pull out Final Fusion and some of these other tools is we just expand that a little bit. You know, what about the incarnation? What about, what about the life of Jesus and his, his, his methodology? Is there a definitive pattern of, of, of how, you know, this works? So, you know, expanding on just death, burial, resurrection to incarnation, lifestyle way of living you know death burial resurrection ascension uh li living king jesus and as we as we as we broker a fuller understanding of the gospel i think there are authoritative i'm going to say definitive patterns that frankly you know my five years of seminary did not enable me to access so you know so i love yeah i love that idea that you know a, a, a smaller definition or version of the gospel or partial gospel is going to limit limit you know my, my disciple making uh, energies there, and what I would say as a segue uh, to, to talking about the two funnels, um, you know, if I was given prescriptive and descriptive as my two lenses for looking at Jesus. So you read the Gospels and it's like, wow, it's so historically bound. Clearly, it's not prescriptive because I'm not you know walking in my sandals on the dusty streets of you know, Galilee and, and, you know, the, the playbook of proclaiming the kingdom, whatever, healing, you know, casting out demons and, you know, being welcomed into a, a you know, a person of peace in a home and blah, blah, blah. And all that, all that cultural stuff, like it just all of a sudden it throws me into descriptive only. Like this is something that's describing what happened, but loses some of its authoritative value in my life today. And so between descriptive and prescriptive, I like to talk about definitive pattern. There is authority in the methodology of Jesus. And we need to look at, at the, at the, we need to retranslate that contextually, but you know, the person of peace is a definitive pattern that it's, it's kingdom today. It's usable and trainable and approachable today. And all of a sudden that brings new possibility to, to the everyday disciple and the work that God's doing in advance while they're sleeping to give them a fruitful kingdom opportunity the next day when they wake up, because uh, God's already put a person of peace in their sphere of influence. Like we've got to remine out those definitive patterns, you know, as, as, as uh, I would say, as part of God, gospel living. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's been, it's been really interesting of just getting back to uh, just really just getting back to basics of, of understanding what the kingdom gospel is like through the, through some of the Bonhoeffer project uh, uh, toolkit and, uh, and, and going through that. But um uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of a lot of other trainings with. Uh, I think Phil, our director, has gone through like Curtis Sargent's training. We've actually brought in um, uh, Josh Howard from Central India Christian Mission to be able to go through uh, some of these things. I've had conversations with him about uh, a lot, some of your content as well. But um, just really getting back to fundamental, just discovery Bible study methods of just real simple methods of training people to do simple obedience and, and calling them to, to call others to do that and training. And so, um, 
I, I think that maybe we can segue some of that with your 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 multiplication funnel where we have the assimilation yeah. funnel on one thing uh, on one side and the, the the multiplication funnel on the other and and it's usually one or the other in in either that program yeah. church or house church type of model so what do, how do how do you look at those yeah. both together yeah and yeah, i'm glad we can spend a little time on this because this to me you know i'm even surprise myself and, you know, as, as an author, how much this picture keeps nurturing the vision and the imagination for it. What we do is we, we take, whether you want to call it program church, lower room, we take what has become the modern kind of core kind of minimum assimilation funnel out there today. And we call that an attend, connect, serve model. So it's not, you know, any church, you, know, you can't go in and see what is their basic way of talking about attend, connect, serve. And for, if you have 100 people or 100% of people in your worship attendance, on average across the U.S., you're going to get about 50% of them to the next step. And then you'll get, you know, you get another, you get 25% of this group to this step. So you have about a 50%, you know, forgive the engineering language, yield loss. And it's really... If, if this is all you have, and this is, we call this the assimilation funnel or the engagement funnel. This is people getting more involved in your church. And as you do this, it's actually a funnel of diminishing returns, which I use to say, to help you, to help the, the pastor and the leader see, if this is all you have, it's, it's a little bit nonsensical. It's a little bit illogical. Um, um, there's two hidden and dangerous assumptions that is at play and if you have an assimilation funnel only that is that moving from one environment to the next environment equals spiritual growth just because you're going doesn't mean you're growing the other in the most dangerous assumption is that if i get someone to worship to a small group and i get them volunteering in the church that that created a multiplying disciple we know that's not true I don't want to diminish this in any way. We just want to say, we're going to move the finish line. What if, what if this isn't the finish line? And, and again, this is that functional great commission that we started with. So what we do is say, that, what if, what if the, or, we're not going to, not going to get rid of or blame the program funnel. We're just going to make sure that it's fused to the multiplication funnel, which is right the segue. This is the definitive pattern. This is the gospel pre-death, burial, resurrection of Jesus' life. You know, this is the incarnation as, as a definitive pattern for how, for how, you know, the fact that Jesus came into earth and moved into the neighborhood is a definitive pattern. You, you know, you, every, you know, every believer has a place. They're, they, 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 they're, they're literally, they're a banker, they're a plumber, they're a stay-at-home mom, they're a teacher. What And, you know, that's, that place matters, um, but the average church imagination doesn't have a toolbox to, to really get us there. We might preach that it matters, but we don't have a pathway to help people activate uh, and empower them where they live, work, and play. So the multiplication funnel, we build off really four snapshots in scripture. Luke 8, 1 is Jesus as the solo authorized agent of the kingdom, and 12 are with him, but they are not sent yet. Luke 9, 1, the 12 are set. And there's a, there's a absolutely fundamental authority transmission. Tran, you know, and it's, by the way, it's the most dramatic amateur hour ever because you couldn't, you couldn't look at them on their readiness. You had to look at them on their potential. It would, you know, so that, and it's, it's crazy how we, our program church by itself doesn't bring that authority transfer, doesn't make it explicit felt and real by luke 10 1 we see a 6x multiplication factor interestingly it doesn't just go boom north and like blow up it you know three years of ministry i get to acts one and there's that 120 that we've referenced and i just what, what's interesting Andrew, is i do want this is a literal 120 in acts one in the literal upper room but but at the risk of you know and this is so crazy, you couldn't even think there's any eisegesis. It's just interesting that symbolically, if, if, if their pastor's listening, every, every man, woman, and child who, who you're shepherding, they like 
sociologically, we we say you, they probably have about 120 people they know. Add up their extended family, their neighborhood, where they work, their interests and hobbies. They probably know about 120 people, and that's really cool. So, uh, is that 120 people part of their story? God's movement in the world, God's redemptive uh, dream in the world, and how do we how do we help them learn the patterns and definitive pattern of Jesus through this? Uh, and how does the Blue Funnel Church basically exist, you know, for this, for this red funnel activity in the world? The blue is the church gathered. The red is the church scattered. And we've known each other a long time, Andrew. What I'd say is everything I've ever believed in, anything you've ever read or we've worked on together in certification and tools, I find this accelerates my imagination for what everything the vision frame and God dreams represent. So you know, as you saw in the book, the red funnel is the mission measures. That's just what kind of disciple is our church designed to produce. But this helps me create more substance and dreaming about naming that as the win, like helping people really engage that. And I found I that the, show how paradigm stuck some professional ministers can be. On Monday, I was in a church and I asked them to share their best red funnel stories. And interestingly, what they did was they shared great blue funnel serving stories, volunteering stories, but they didn't get to red funnel. We had to, we had to, we had to do that. Sorry, Andrew, on our, our little training, we got my daughter, my, my four-year-old daughter busted in here. Hey, honey. No worries, man. Dad's talking with some church leaders. Huh? Oh, I love your new shoes. We're getting ready to go on a road trip. Zoom I'll be right with you, honey. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, so, so, th so th this just... I know we don't have time to do much more than that, but I just want, uh, like, every day I'm having conversations, and church leaders and their teams are really getting some great conversations through this tool. So, um, and and we have the the field guide is coming out on this that will really get it kind of to the typical kind of Mancini S toolbox stuff that that we that we've done before. So this was kind of a, a signal that there's a new master tool coming and a follow up book to give you the how to steps on it. Yeah, no, that's great, man. I, I look forward to that. <laughs> I always, I always get made fun of as a little mini, mini Mancini or, uh, people say I have a man crush on Mancini, but, uh, I've just, I've been blessed by our tools. They've blessed our church planters for years and, uh, just really being able to, uh, to, to walk through some of this content. And this is, I mean, just geared around, you know, how I mean, you mentioned in the book that every, every leader or most leaders of every different faith tribe have kind of seen just the, the fault in, in, in what our process has kind of looked like in making this, this major shift of getting back to, back to basics and back to true disciple making. And, um, and we've, we've tried to articulate for a while and use resources for a while to do a lot of the, what your, your assimilation funnel and the, the overlap of, of, or the funnel fusion that it really kind of represents in that picture. So I'm really grateful for, for what that is. But, um, uh, is there any, what, what's the one area, just as a final question, what's the one area that you get, uh, the most pushback from in, in your future church content? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I have that. Well, let me respond first by saying I really am been surprised that I haven't gotten as much as I thought. I was a little nervous because there's a little bit more of this prophetic tone and people know me as the friend of the organized church. What, what people have said is, wow, I, I literally, this is my favorite thing is, you know, Pastor of the Day said, well, every page, I feel like you were kicking me in the butt, you know, and it's like, it, it, but they're laughing while I say it. So they're, they're basically saying, Thank you for challenging me. It was hard. It was hard. When you talk about program church, it's hard to read, but they're always smiling. They're always winking. They're like, boy, you know, doggone it. I needed that, you know, kind of thing. So um, I'm trying to think the, um, I think um, there, there's not, there's not been, there's not been pushback. I think where the biggest breakthrough I think needs to happen personally is that law six. That, 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 that real church growth is led by calling, not celebrity. And I would say that um, it takes some time for the imagination of the average pastor to appreciate how much calling is all around them that they, they're not even aiming at. They don't care about it. Like it's sad. I mean, the, the blue funnel, that, that the program churches that we've been, you know, and I talk about the eras. And so I unpack this, you know, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, to the missional reorientation. So I give 80 years of here are the 20-year generational 
modes that I name of how we've thought about church. And, and, the, and the truth is we've been doing, you know, we've been, say, we've been saying, we can do it. You can help come listen to me, preach, come get connected in small groups. We run and come serve the blue funnel. And um, maybe the, uh, I was, I was, um, I was with St. Marshall on the exponential platform a couple of years ago. And she's like the pastor of AT&T, an amazingly gifted, powerful African-American black woman who's a VP, you know, level, highest level. In these. And, and, you know, she goes to church. What is, what is the church's imagination for St. Marshall? Come hand out worship guides or come, you know, serve an hour a week in the children's ministry. Fantastic. We need to do that. That's, we need to keep the door, the house chores of church, a program church. But they have no imagination for her life breaking forth, impacting thousands of people, you know, one-on-one -on -one every day, but impacting a whole giant organization. And so that's to me where the, I, you know, I could just talk forever. I, I got out of an Uber in Atlanta not too long ago. This gentleman who was driver, just great believer, probably late fifties. And he was bragging on his daughter's recent renewal in spiritual interest. And you want to know what his highest statement of bragging on his daughter, who's a believer, you know, loving God and trying to make an impact with her life. He, he said, he said, Will, she's now a door holder in Louis Giglio's church at Passion City. Oh, I love Louis Giglio and we need to hold the doors open for people coming to the church. But like, please, someone tell me that is not the highest pinnacle of bragging on our children. Like what, what, what contribution are they bringing to the world other than opening the door at church? And I'm like, you know, what are we doing? So that that's the place that that um andrew i think it's not pushback but it's sticking point and it's a it's a it's a failure of, of imagination um for the pastors who are listening when you preach to that person their story so matters and i just go straight to esther every person you preach to every day is here for such a time as this as this and the the days of their life are, are given Ephesians 2.10, you know, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance that they should walk in them. And until we get to special calling and help them name that, you know, just talking at them from the Bible every week doesn't activate all of the capacity and potential God has put in that person. So, um, and I would say the red funnel means the church has to become a training center. Uh, rather than just being a blue funnel teaching center. And I would end on that note that in the next 20 years, that's one of the macro themes in the future church. We must move from teaching center to training center. We must move from nine to five is incidental to the mission of Jesus to that every man, woman, nine to five is essential to the mission of Jesus. So. Yep. Absolutely, man. Well, I, uh, I've been super blessed to being able to lead people through some of the unique process as well and just see, uh, just see the lights come on and, and their face, their eyes, and just, uh, just how excited they are when they realize that God has created them for something much more than, uh, the, than the, than what they've been sold uh, by most pastors in their in their walk, and so uh, it's just super exciting. I'm 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 all in with that one, man. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I appreciate. I I uh, absolutely huge fan of your life and ministry. What's happening at Nexus, and just so grateful that you model mastery with these tools. That fuels me. I want to be the you know the nerdy tool maker back in the workshop, so that you know apostolic leaders can go out and and use these um, and, and contextualize them where God's called them. So, so grateful for the, the way you, you multiply the work of, um, of those tools. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for your time today, Will. I appreciate it. Have a great trip, bro. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thanks. God bless. Bye.